Thank you. Chautauqua, first experience. What's your sense of that place? Oh, my. It's, a, it's an intellectual feast, and it's also beautiful right by the water. I mean, it's just, it's, it's idyllic. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was really great. I mean, I just, I had a great time. I mean, I just, it was just fun. I mean, you could tell the audience was paying attention, right? You can tell. I mean, yeah, you commented on it. People were paying attention. Yeah. Um, and um, just to, to see the head nods and, and that you were, you know, actually talking to people who were intellectually engaged, not just about law or not just about the current Supreme Court, but just, you know, about the world and our, and our history. Uh, that, that was a pretty remarkable experience. And then the, the kind of atmosphere, right, the, the hall of philosophy itself, you know, being open air and um, I don't, I've, never, I've never given a talk like that at any place like that before. It was a treat. What did you know about Chautauqua beforehand? So when you told people, I'm going to Chautauqua, what was their sense and well, your sense? Well, sadly, when I tell like people, you know, peers, you know, the first thing people mention is, you know, what happened, the stabbing of Salman Rushdie. But for me, as I think I told you, like what pops into my mind is that, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr.'s famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, um, opinion in the uh, 1922 federal baseball case that, that people somewhat incorrectly attribute as to the, you know, antitrust exemption for Major League Baseball, ex exempting them from the Sherman Antitrust Act. It really all Holmes said was that um, baseball wasn't interstate commerce by the 1922 definition uh, of interstate commerce. But one of the analogies that he made to Major League Baseball, he said they were purely exhibitions, and he analogized them to the Chautauqua lecture circuit, and so for me, like I'm in Chautauqua. This is what <laughs> Justice Holmes is talking about, right? Like it, I was finally I, I knew what Chautauqua was, but I'd never been, and so to be able to go there and speak there, it was a huge honor, and just to actually like now I, I have this warm set of memories and, and kind of experiences from there. It's not abstract for me anymore, and I've heard you talk about it. I've heard John Barrett talk about it. I've, you know. It's just, it's just great to be able to experience something that you've heard about for a very long time. Well, now you're part of the alumni team. Well, I, I feel honored to have done it. Well, you, you talked about the federal baseball. You've written about Kurt Flood. But that wasn't your first taste of sports. Talk about how you ended up being with the Baltimore Sun. Well, you know, for me, as a kid, when I read Roger Kahn's book, The Boys of Summer, which is about those great Brooklyn Dodger teams from, you know, the late '40s, and about Jackie Robinson and and um, Roger Kahn grew up a Brooklyn Dodger fan, and his dream was to cover the Brooklyn Dodgers when he got out of college, and there he, he was able to, you know, realize his dream. And then so he writes about them when during their playing days, and then he does this amazing. Now it's kind of cliche, but then he goes back and he profiles all of them and what they're up to um, in later life. And, but uh, to me, it was almost a, it, it was about a boy who falls in love with baseball, but it was also about um, an American Jewish kid assimilating through baseball. And, and the, the, his relationship to baseball made him different than his father was, who was you know a first generation immigrant. So to me, the book worked on so many levels. and. Um, I still think Boys of Summer is the greatest book that's, baseball book that's mm -hmm. ever been written. And I thought after I read that book, like, wouldn't it be amazing to cover the Orioles, to cover this team that I grew up watching, that my dad would take me out of school, you know, on opening day, we would go to Memorial Stadium and we'd go, and, you know, I'll never forget Cal Ripken on opening day, um, hitting a home run off Roger Clemens in, mm -hmm. in 1989. And, and I just, it was just a dream. It, it was a dream. I, I almost pushed everything else off to the side. You know, I had professors who said, you know, do you want to go to Cambridge? Do you want to go to Oxford after school? Do you want me to nominate you for, you know, a fellowship? And, no, why would, why would I want to go to Oxford? Why would I want to go to Cambridge? I'm going to go cover the Orioles. You know, I just like, and I look back on my 22-year-old, you're an idiot. You know, they were offering you an on-ramp, you know, to Oxford or Cambridge, and, and you just kind of gave them, some, you know, a, 
an idiotic 20-year-old response that, uh, um, you know, I want to cover the Orioles. What could be more important than that? But it was the most important thing uh, to me at the time. And, and so um, to be able to do it. And then so I get there, but I graduate in 1994. Um, in May, I start in June. I'm at a handful of Oriole games as a reporter. The baseball strike hits. Yeah. And that just changed my life in a totally different direction because now I'm not covering games. Now I'm covering, I mean, Congress, covering congressional hearings. And um, I'll just, I'll never forget being in the halls of Congress. And I was 22 years old talking to Howard Metzenbaum, the senator from Ohio, who was really wanted to take away the antitrust exemption immediately. Right, that was his solution. And, um, but I learned about the, it forced me to learn a side of the game that I never really paid that much attention about, mm -hmm. which is the labor history of the game, the economic history of the game. And it forced me to kind of dig in and read federal baseball mm -hmm. and read the Tolson case and read the Flood v. Coon. And then in August of that year, 94, there's a players union meeting. There's a union meeting. The Players Association is meeting in Atlanta, and Kurt Flood um, speaks to the Players Association meeting. And, and I said, and then I started reading about Flood, and I'm like, this guy is a great story. This this guy is, and, and another book that really influenced me, and influenced my decision to go to law school, but just influenced me in general was um, Anthony Lewis's book Gideon's Trump yeah, 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 yeah. about Gideon's versus or Greenway. I said. Kurt Flood's story is baseball's Gideon's trumpet, right? It's one man taking on the establishment. And, and so I knew then and there, you know, I just filed it away, like write a book about Kurt Flood. And um, I should I wish I didn't, you know, you know, I wish I had been you, Greg Peterson, right, and flown down to Atlanta and tried to get an interview with, with uh, Kurt Flood, you know, and just you know, wouldn't let no, take, take no for an answer. Um, but, I don't know if I learned it then in 94 or later. I can't remember when Howard Stamp's book, The Summer of 64, came out. But when I read that, and I read that Flood was the only member of either team who wouldn't talk to him, I said, well, if he's not going to talk to David Howard Stamp, you know, <laughs> who is one of the great journalists sure. and baseball writers ever, he's not talking to me. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I remember Howard Stamp said he had designs on making his life into a movie, so he wouldn't talk to Howard Stamp. But I, I wish I had tried. I, I wish I'd at least gone to Atlanta right. and um, and just been at the players' meeting so I would have some lyrics rather than getting secondary um, accounts. And then, he, of course, he's dead, you know, three years later. And I, by that point, I'd gone to law school. I really wasn't a great baseball writer in the traditional sense. I wasn't great at writing game stories. I wasn't great, um, you know, writing a story with you know, the deadline's at 11.45 and the game's over at 11.30. Like, oh, that's not my forte. And that is a wickedly hard skill. Um, and I liked more of the investigative stories and, and, you know, writing about the business side of sports. So the, the, the baseball strike was an opportunity for me. It showed me what I was good at and I liked. And, um, and then covering the games and, and um, talking to the guys in the clubhouse and, you know, people that you grew up idolizing. You know. Well, it's just it. I mean, you had access. I, I Having that from your belt yeah. that gave you press credentials, yeah. get you access. Can you talk about some personalities that, that kind of jump out at you? Yeah, well, the two people on the Orioles that I really liked had both gone to college um, before I, um, I, I, you know, they, they went into the minor leagues. And, and that's um, Jeffrey Hammonds, who was a Golden Spikes winner at Stanford, mm -hmm. and Brady Anderson, who had spent I think a couple of years at UC Santa Barbara, one of the UC schools, and that they were—I just really liked both of them. I mean, they were both super engaging. Jeffrey now works for the Players Union, and mm -hmm. and, um, and Brady had, a, and he was an all-star with the Brewers. And Brady Anderson had a long role in managing the Orioles until a couple of years ago. But they were just really bright and inquisitive, and I really liked talking to them. But they, you know. It was fun. I mean, I got to do some things that I just, you know, were like lifelong things that just by virtue of, I was a big Eddie Murray fan growing up, mm -hmm. uh, and um, he was probably my favorite player, you know, my first favorite player, and, and I got to go to Minnesota when he hit his 3,000th hit. Who was he with? I want to say Dodgers at the time. I know Mets. He was with the Mets at the time. Either the Mets or the Dodgers. But mm -hmm. So it, I can't how did how does that mean? He said, I can't figure it out. Oh, no, he was in Cleveland. Eddie was in Cleveland at that time because he's in Minnesota playing a game. And so 
I got to cover the, his 3,000th hit, and I wrote a long profile on him. And Murray didn't talk to the press at all um, because of a horrible interview that Dick Young ripped him in the New York Post. Um, I think he went like over something in the 79 World Series. Mm. Dick Young ripped him after a long interview, and Murray's like, never again. And, and um, he wouldn't talk to me, but I talked to his brother. I talked to all his family members, right? I did the whole Greg Peterson talk to everybody who's ever known Eddie Murray and, and tried to write a profile on yeah. him. Um, and, and it was really fun. And he, he was just, he's a complicated person. And, you know, there were a lot of elements of race um, involved with Murray and, and, you know, a high salary black player in Baltimore, which is a southern city. Not a lot of people realize it, but, you know, gave Jackie Robinson the hardest time of any city in the minor leagues. And uh, so it was really fun. But just to see that kind of stuff and experience that type of stuff and to go to Cooperstown for a whole Hall of Fame induction. I wrote about a Negro League player from Baltimore who got inducted to the Hall of Fame. In fact, it was very sad. He's from Baltimore. His name is Leon Day. Yeah. Um, he's a pitcher for the New York Eagles. And he, um, I wrote him, and there was a big campaign on to get him in the Hall of Fame. And so I was writing about it, and I was on the front page of the whole newspaper twice in a week about Leon Day because he got, in, he got elected to the Hall of Fame. And then six days later, he died of a heart. And he died. Oh my gosh. So I was on the front page one day when he got in. Then I was on the front page when he died. And um, it was amazing. Because you know, I had written about the Negro Leagues. My honors thesis was on the Negro Leagues in college. You know, I'd written about the Homestead Grays in Washington. So I knew all about the Negro Leagues. And it was kind of deeply invested in that history. I, I think I'm in, attracted to histories that I don't know anything about and find fascinating. Like, how can I, as a huge baseball fan, not know anything about the Negro Leagues growing right. up or just know a little bit about Satchel Paige? And, you know, I know set the name Satchel Paige. I know the name Josh Gibson. And then everything else is just a big abstraction. Right. And, and just, I was totally attracted to that. Same thing with Kurt Flood, right? I knew who Kurt Flood was. But I didn't really know what he had done. Right. Right, and so, like, if I didn't know that, like, how many other huge baseball fans are there out there? Um, that don't know about that stuff. Um, so, but anyway, you know, I had some going to the induction. I, I think, and the other big moment besides the induction was when I got my Baseball Writers of the Association card. Car. Oh my God. Right, and I'm just, you know, I just, I felt like I was admitted to a club. Yeah. And now a lot of the reporters aren't voting for the Hall of Fame in the major newspapers because they don't want to be part of the story, and, and, and because they became the story when they right. um, didn't. Um, vote for all the steroid guys, and um, but still, it was just neat. Like I felt, and um, I think what I miss most from the whole sports writing experience are not the games, like what happened on the field. It's not even the access to the clubhouse. It's the hijinks in the press box, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. And it's just the personalities who were involved. Um, they were, and they accepted me as like a 22-year-old. Right in their little group, and not everybody in the press box got accepted into their little group, right? And yeah. yes, they made me go get cinnamon-covered pretzels from, you know, the pretzel stand for everybody in the booth. But they didn't do that out of like a hazing. They did that because they liked me, yeah. right? You know, and it just it, that was. You know, I'll be forever grateful to you know, the people who were there. Does it being a sports writer? Does it ever dawn on you that there's 30 guys in this press corps sitting in the same location, watching the same game with the typewriters in front of them or laptops, whatever it is now, and somehow the stories are different. Yeah. I mean, their lens is what, I mean, it's like- Well, there's also different. a huge competition, Greg, right? Like in those days in particular, which was really the last gasp of newspapers. The Baltimore Sun was a huge deal in Baltimore, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, was the primary news outlet and, and was the biggest, news outlet about the Orioles, right? This is just when the internet is taking off, right? You know, nobody is competing with the Baltimore Sun for Orioles coverage except the Washington Post, which doesn't have a baseball team. Our competition day in, day out with the Post was intense. And so, yes, you're sitting in there alongside your competition every day writing, and you better be doing a better job than they are, yeah. right? Or you better have everything that they have. So you know, there's, a, there's an element of, not athletics, but just competition you know, within sports writing. That said, right, there were guys that you just liked, you know, who were like, they, you might be competing against them every day, right? 
I mean, the worst thing is to wake up early in the morning and get a call from your editor early in the morning, like, hey, so-and-so had X. Why didn't you have that? Or so-and-so said, why? Why didn't you have that? Yeah. I mean, that's a bad feeling. Yeah. Um, but it was intense. It was fun. Was the intensity, I mean, there was the game action. Yeah. And guess, who was the manager then? For well, the there were several of them. And, and so first it was John Oates. Okay. And um, he got fired. And then it was Phil Regan. And he did not like me. And um, he thought I was second guessing him all the time. And then the last manager was the best one by far, former manager of the New York Mets, Davy Johnson, mm -hmm. who was totally smart, very self-assured, and who you would walk into his office post game and he says, you guys are gonna second guess me about this move, this move, and this move. And this is why I did X, Y, and Z. Right, he's totally, you know, he's a math guy. He's thought it all through. Um, he was, and he was great with, Davy was great with us. He just really knew how to, so your access to the players, was it through the press conference? No. At that time, were you able to get on the bench and talk to the guys individually? Well, you know, you I don't think you can do that. You can't do that. Um, you Pre-game, you could at a certain time, but you had a lot of access. The great thing about baseball was always your access in the clubhouse, right, until a certain time before the game. Mm -hmm. So you had all, I mean, you would get there like two or three hours early before the game because as soon as that clubhouse was opened up for you, you had access to whoever you wanted who was willing to talk to you. And that included the manager, that included the players, it included the broadcast guys, it would include the guys from the other team, right? So like, you know, I think I've told you when Sparky Anderson and Ernie Harwell come into town from the Detroit Times, what to do because Sparky will talk forever in his office and Ernie Harwell will talk forever, sit down on the on the bench in the, in the dugout and just talk. And it's fun and you learn a lot, not just about the history of the game, you can also learn a lot about the other team right. from the players, the manager, the play-by-play -play guy, the other, the journalists on the other team. And then you get to befriend these journalists, you know, who are coming into town and see, you know, who's nice, um, who's um, good at what they do, right? And it's, it's just, it's, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Talk about Ripken's run to, oh for the, to God, beat that 21-30 number. It was crazy. I mean, yeah. look, I've been keeping track of this, Greg. I mean, I, I was a diehard Memorial fan. I mean, since the late 80s. Like, it was like I was in high school thinking about this. I think when he passed, oh, I can't remember the name of the guy I broke it. I said National Leader. Oh, I'll think about it. When he broke, like, one, you know, the guy before Garrett, I mean, I, I think I even mapped it out at one point. Like, well, when is this going to be? When I was in high school or junior high. Mm. And, you know, because he had a, a consecutive inning streak for a while, as well as a consecutive game streak. And then I think his dad, um, who was managing him briefly for, like, you know, part of that 0-21 season, and then got fired quickly. But they, they shut that down, the consecutive. But I'd been thinking about this forever. Yeah. Just like assuming that you could be superhuman. And, and Ripken was, first of all, a great athlete. He was a great basketball player. He was a great soccer player. He was built like a tank, but he could also jump high, right? So, I mean, he was just, he was just an ox. And um, I, it was just, a, it was an amazing thing. That whole season was an amazing thing. But I, just even the, the ballpark is up. It was like physically hot in the ballpark. So, uh, you know, I'll never forget that day. It was steaming hot in the ballpark because there were so many people crammed into the right. stadium that there was just, it was, it was just, it was just boiling because you shouldn't have had that many people in that park. There were way more than the announced crowd. Everyone, any, anyone who was, everyone was there. Like Shirley Povich was there. And, mm -hmm. you know, Shirley Povich was a long time sports editor of the Washington, Washington Post, yeah. but, but he, he covered the team in the, you know, he, he covered Garrigan and Ruth. Right, like, you know, that, that's how old he was, and he was there uh, watching, you know, Ripken break Garrick's record. And then to Homer that day, to take the curtain call and to go around the, at the outer rim of the outfield. And I remember it was Raphael Palmero of all people, who was a good person, I'm always good with us, who pushed Ripken out yeah. of the dugout. Right, it was just an amazing day, and great for the city. And and the Sun um, produced, um, and you're allowed to do this. There's a big legal case about it. 
had like sweatshirts with the um, 2131 cover of the paper and, and like um, you know posters of the 20. It was a big deal in the whole city because Ripken also. It, yeah, I think a lot of people forget this. Like it's not just that he was on the Orioles his whole career. I mean he was born in Havard of Grace, Maryland. And, Grew up in Aberdeen, Maryland, which is about an hour outside of Baltimore. And mm -hmm. you know, his father was with the team for 20, 30, you know, 30 years, like his whole career, you know, in the in the minor leagues and at the major league levels, the third base coach. Like, you know, he, he was one of the state's own players. That's such a rare sure. thing for that to happen. So it was a it was a great and then I mean to have it all happen at Camden Yards too. It's just at one of the great ballparks that's ever been built. And I had bought tickets for the next day in Cleveland, which I was praying for rain. Ah, uh, well that would have been terrible for the city. I know it, but as it turned out, fine for the city, not for me, because I was betting, I bought, I figured out his schedule. Yeah, that's smart. He was gonna be in Cleveland, and as it turned out, we were there, but it was 21-32, and you know, they made a big deal out of it. Yeah. But, uh, it wasn't and then of course, before. Cal's brother Bill was on that Indian team. Right. I don't know if you remember, because Bill, they let Bill take it the day off to go to Baltimore and Did watch, yeah, yeah, with his mother and father from a box. I mean, it just, that's kind of an amazing thing yeah. that the Indians let Bill, you know, recognizing how historic this is. And Bill, at that point in his career, not being an integral member of the Cleveland Indians. Yeah. Great announcer, by the way. I don't know if you've watched him on the I haven't, no. He's a great announcer. He's in many ways like the antithesis of Ripken. Like, Ripken's kind of, doesn't have enough personality to be a, to be a great, TV announcer, and he had a stint on TBS, but Bill is on the baseball network, and he's just a natural. Yeah. My daughter worked for two summers with for Cal Ripken in Aberdeen. They had that, he had a, yeah, the little league. Consult, well, he had a consulting firm for minor leagues. Yeah, I didn't and, know that. And uh, she was at, uh, in a New England School of Law uh -huh. up there, and she was looking for an internship, and, yeah. and she got, you know, she, she for two years worked there in Baltimore, and uh, She'd always complain, she got like $500. I said, Amy, you have no idea. When the day is done, you're gonna get a letter that says, to whom it may concern. You were a very good employee, Cal Ripken Jr. That is gonna open up a lot of doors. And it did. Yeah. Next thing you know, she's Tigers, whoa. I, I was surprised Ripken didn't have a bigger career in the game. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still like, I, I still am just kind of, one of the things just looking back you know, I just assumed, I mean, Cal's very cerebral and kind of very, just lived and breathed the game. And I just thought somebody who lived and breathed the game like he did would have been a, either a manager or a general manager or, or even in the Orioles' front office. And it just never happened. The fact that Ripken's best friend on the team was Brady Anderson. And the fact that Brady had a long run on, you know, within the organization yeah. and, and Ripken didn't. Um, I just it's it's one of those things that I can't kind of figure out, and um, because I, I, he just has the, you know, coach's son. He just has all the pedigree, right? right? And, and all the experience and just and knowledge, and it's I think don't think it speaks well for the Orioles yeah. that they didn't try to, you know, he could have been a vice president of something or other, even if they didn't want him. Was, yeah, front and so uh, uh, Another major person during that, I think during that time, was Chuck Thompson. Yeah, well, Chuck Thompson, I mean, I, my dad grew up listening to Chuck Thompson. I grew up listening to Chuck Thompson. And then Chuck Thompson was the radio voice of the Orioles for sure. years and years and years. And his, his is he dead when you were there? Yeah, he was really old. I mean, he was telling me stories about, yeah, Chuck Thompson was there. Not every day, Chuck Thompson was there. And then um, their um, PA announcer was real famous. He was. Rex like Barney. Rex Barney for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he was a really nice man, too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then he said, give that fan a contract. It was yeah. a big thing when someone caught a foul ball. And both very nice men. And Baltimore is just a great baseball town for you know, just such a long time. Brooks Robinson, of course, yeah. really being Ripken's hero growing up and really the person that Ripken emulated in the way that Ripken carried himself with kids and giving autographs. I mean, that 2131 year, Ripken would stand on the first base or third base line for hours and yeah. sign autographs for kids. I mean, that speaks so well for his character that he would do that, but the person who really taught him to do that was, you know, Brooks Robinson. Just like you today, signing autographs 
with security right behind you. Yeah, well, you know, it's a little different, uh, but it was fun. I mean, that, that was a good time. But it, the, the, being covering the Orioles was a great experience. I mean, it was something that, yeah, and just working for the Baltimore Sun and working for newspapers at that time, and getting to cover a Supreme Court case about sports, as I think we've talked about before, and you know, just seeing that. Was, was, that, was that an aha moment for you? During your Baltimore Sundays, you go cover a Well, I knew I wasn't good at what I thought I wanted to do. Okay. Right? So I knew I wasn't good at writing a game story. I knew I could be a reporter, right, for the newspaper, but maybe like as an investigative reporter, maybe a sports business reporter. I thought that would have like fit my skill set a little better. Um, but the aha moment was that day with Lyle Dennison, who was covering the Supreme Court since um, either 56 or 58, maybe it was 58. So uh, th this was, uh, what year was this? This was 95, 96, I think. Brown Vienna Pro Football Inc. was 96. I can't remember when the oral argument was, but I knew that day when Lyle took me to the court. And we covered that case together. I'm like, this is unbelievable. I mean, I've grown up all my life in Washington. I've never been to the Supreme Court oral argument, which is crazy, right? And, and just to, to grow up outside the city and never been to a Supreme Court oral argument. And then to go see something that you just can't see on TV, right? It's one of the last things. Right. You just can't see it on television, right? And, and it's even now, they didn't even have the audio available then, right? Like they do now. And, and, um, but even when you live stream the audio, there's something different. Right. being in that courtroom um, in a case and just I, I, I knew the moment we got out of there I'm like I want to do this right this is way more behind the ropes than being in the major league dugout plus it's kind of fascinating and heady and hard and it, it has its own set of challenges covering the Supreme Court for a daily newspaper I, it, I'm amazed at how people do that and you're know, able to read the opinions now are so long and to be able to write the story um, and get through the long opinions and focus on the key paragraph that you need to quote in the next day. That's a hard thing to do. Well, they're handing you the advance sheet. It's not like you had it for weeks. All of a sudden, everybody's got it at the same time. And especially if it's a high-end case, they're immediately going on the air trying to figure right. out. And you, there are some of them where they're trying to figure out what the decision was. Well, yeah, there are some people who've gotten big cases wrong. I won't name them by name, but um, when the Affordable Care Act cases or argued and then decided there were some big day person television personalities that got them yeah totally wrong just because they didn't read the whole opinion and you know wanted to be able to be first with the news and um and, and of course all those reporters are preparing for months and months for the decision to come down yeah. they've read the briefs they've talked to um talking heads about the case and they've educated themselves about the case but that was neat to watch lyle do that watch how he prepared a case and watch how he you know it was neat yeah. So, why? What law school did you just the camera? What law school did you decide to do, and why? Well, I, I didn't. Uh, so I went to law school thinking I wanted to be the next like. By the way, the camera you went to Duke undergraduate. So, so uh, I, uh, I went to law school thinking I wanted to cover the Supreme Court of the United States. That was my law school essay, mm -hmm. and I applied to it, a number of law schools, and um, so I, I knew I. Uh, I, I at least started out with a notion. I think it was the correct one that I didn't want to be a law firm lawyer. And, and at that point, you, once Yale accepted me, and, and they have the reputation of being a law school that is kind of non-traditional in the sense of, you know, a lot of academics, a lot of public servants coming out of Yale, um, teaching a lot of theory and history, and and, and a little less, um, you know, black letter mm -hmm. law, and, and just um. I just thought, I thought, and it was smaller, right? It's much smaller than Harvard is. Um, it, I really, I thought for me at the end, came down to a choice between Yale and Harvard, and uh, I think I made the right choice. It was fun. I had a good time. Did you get out of Yale? You go to, did you immediately go into private practice with William? No, I, I clerked for a Ninth Circuit oh, judge right. first, right, yeah. Dorothy Nelson, um, and that was a great experience. I really didn't know what I wanted to do out of my clerkship. Um, now the Ninth Circuit is out west, right? Yeah, Ninth Circuit. We were in Pasadena, and I mm. lived in Los Angeles. That was really fun. I never lived out there. It was a blast, and we saw just a tremendous amount of cases and advocates, and we got to sit in some different cities. 
and, and that was really fun. Cities I'd never been to, like Anchorage, we sat for a week, and that was fun. And um, the judge was amazing. She's a former dean of USC. She's the, one of the first female deans of a you know, top 25 law school and, um, and, under, and hired a lot of future academics. But I didn't know I wanted to be an academic then. I should have. But I think law school would have been easier for me in some ways if I'd known I wanted to be an academic. And my clerkship would have been a little easier and then I could have done some different things. But I was kind of clueless after my clerkship. I wrote my book on the Negro Leagues after my clerkship. Mm. And I, so I, I took like nine months. I lived at home, which is kind of demoralizing for somebody, you know, 25, 26 years old living at home. And, but I just wrote my book and I wrote a first draft and then I, I wasn't getting any money. I was like using my bank account and that I'd earned from the sun. And once it was near zero, mm -hmm. I, knew, I went to work at a law firm out of kind of financial <laughs> Necessity. But I wasn't really thinking strategically about what I wanted to do. I had a nice, a good summer at Williams and Connolly. They had a lot of First Amendment work, and I thought, well, I'll go there and I'll do First Amendment law, and that'll be fun, and it'll be a little mix of the constitutional stuff I like. It'll be representing publications like newspapers and magazines. I'll like that. Maybe that'll be my way into the law. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it was the right fit for me. Not that I love Williams and Conley, it's amazing for amazing lawyers, um, but I, I just don't know. I should have probably been working on more appellate briefs mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, going to a firm with a larger Supreme Court presence, do that for a couple of years and write briefs and, and go into academia. But, you know, I was sort of, there was no kind of straight line into academia for me. And so after a couple of years at Williams and Conley, I knew I wasn't meant to be a law firm lawyer long term and I left to go work on my book on Kurt Flood and, and you know I just I left without a book contract and I just started writing and uh, eventually I got got a book contract but you know at least one of the very well intentioned partners told me you're crazy you should not do this if you were my kid I would tell you do not leave this firm to go write a book another book you're not a good career path but I just knew I wanted to tell this Kurt yeah. Flood story which is kind of burning inside of me since I was the son. So I did it. It was fun. Well, okay. and, uh, and the Kurt Flood case keeps coming back. It's like the case that keeps on giving. And uh, you were the first to write about it, and therefore I'm sure you're the go-to guy. But it's funny, like at the time I quit my job, Greg, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt you, at the time I quit my job, there were like four or five people working on Kurt Flood. Books. Really? And... Um, I remember there was a librarian at the Library of Congress. I was already, you know, addicted to the library even at that time. And he said, "Oh, it's too bad that you're writing on Kurt Flood. This guy's been working on a Kurt Flood book for months." And then I heard about somebody else working on a Kurt Flood book, and then somebody else. Like, how many people are writing about Kurt Flood? And then I just said, "Screw it. I'm going to do it better, right?" Or, or like, and you know, sure enough, these people kind of fell by the wayside. A couple of people did come out with Kurt Flood books, but they were different, right? Mine was different. And um, it was really fun. But I, it was like all on me, though, doing that, like because I was using all the money I'd earned at Williams and Connolly. Mm -hmm. And um, I did get a book advance eventually. I got it. And that really, I mean, that's a kind of a funny story. Um, that I, Even just getting an, a literary agent happened because of my time at the Baltimore Sun. I, did I tell you this story ever? No. I was on a, the ball field before a game one day, and I turned to one of the guys at the Sun, and I said, hey, I think that's Richard Ben Kramer. And they're like, who's that? And I'm like, have you read What It Takes? And they're like, no. I'm like, it's the greatest book about politics that's ever been written. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly about a presidential campaign. I'd read it one summer when I was working at a newspaper. I mean, I, I was obsessed with the book. And I saw him there, and I'd read his article in Esquire, What Do You Think of Ted Williams Now?, which is one of the great pieces of base, base sports writing ever in the, in the 100 greatest articles about sports edited by David Halberstam. That one's in the top three. Mm. And um, so there he was on the field. And, uh, and, and somebody, and they said, no, I don't know who that is. That's not Richard Ben Kramer. So the guy comes up to me and he goes, are you Brad Snyder? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I'm Richard Ben Kramer. Wow. And, um, he, Richard had started his career. He'd gone to Johns Hopkins, and then he um, started his first job out of college. Was at the Baltimore Sun, and um, he knew the editor, 
who he was the front page editor of the paper. I told you I wrote those Leon Day stories for the front page editor, and he said to the front page editor, I've been commissioned by Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated is having a bake-off to decide who gets to be the next editor-in-chief. And so they had one editor, one issue, and one editor, the other issue. And one of the editors hired Richard to write a profile of Cal Ripken Jr. And he says, this guy at the Sun, who I used to work with, he said, I should come talk to you. Really? So I talked to him all about my experiences with Cal Ripken. He wrote this piece that I thought was hilarious. And um, the, the, the piece was um, a cartoon cover of Ripken on the front page. And it wasn't very flattering of, of Ripken. It was, I mean, he sort of compared base Ripken to like the Inner Harbor, which at the time was the kind of centerpiece of the city of Baltimore. It's not anymore, but he said, it's not really Baltimore. It's just the kind of tourist attraction of Baltimore. It was not flattering, but it was funny. And, um, but I got to know Richard, and at that point he um, started to work on his book on Joe DiMaggio. He wanted to hire my, he said, do you have any brothers? He wanted to ask me. I said, yes, I have a younger brother. He's two years, three years behind me at Duke, and he's interested in journalism, and I said, I want to hire your brother as a research assistant on my book. And I pitched to my brother, and to this day I still can't believe he didn't do it. And my brother went to work for Congressional Quarterly instead. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why would you go work for Congressional Quarterly and not go work for Richard <laughs> Ben Kramer? But anyway, Richard and I became friends. And one day, I'm, I'm you know, this time, I'm, now it's like years later, I'm at the Smithsonian at a book signing. Like it's like a baseball book thing. And I'm there and I'm signing copies of my home, Beyond the Shadow of the Centers about the Homestead Grays. And I'm signing book and in walks Richard Ben Kramer. Shake hands. And he's signing copies of his DiMaggio book. Like, who do you think has the longer line to sell books? Yeah. Um, him, obviously. He's great. And the book's great. And he says, what are you doing? And I tell him my story. And he goes, you don't have an agent? I said, no. And I said, I hired one and he couldn't sell the book. And, uh, he said, and he makes a call to his agent. And then within a week, I have his agent as my agent. Within two weeks after that, I have a book advance wow. for, my, for my book with like, all because of Richard Ben Kramer. And then he read chapters of it. He read, That's oh, wonderful. He, he, he wrote, read some early chapters of it. And you know, he's since passed away from lung cancer, but was just amazingly generous. And here's the amazing thing, Greg. Like, he wasn't just generous with me. Like, I've talked to so many aspiring journalists and young reporters who he was willing to give of his time. And that just speaks well for someone who was a Pulitzer Prize winner in the Middle East, who'd written best piece of sports writing about Ted Williams, yeah. wrote an acclaimed book on Joe DiMaggio that was kind of a warts and all portrayal of DiMaggio, and and um, just the, his generosity of spirit um, to young people and, and to people who wanted to be him. Yeah, um, I just thought it was just an amazing quality of his, and and um, he was a great person and a, and just a real inspiration to me. How much of a thrill was it to be asked to do the introduction at the Supreme Court oh, yeah. prior to the, the not the mock trial, but the, the reimagining of the, of the trial yeah, itself? It's almost like a re-argument of, re yeah. Yeah, yeah. Re yeah. of Flood v. Coon. Yeah, yeah. It was a huge thrill. I mean, I had never yeah. I had never met a justice of the Supreme Court before. I'd, oh, really? I'd certainly never, no, never, right? Like, yeah. Who meets a justice of the Supreme Court? I'd never met one. And then to be asked... And then to go into her, and like, I'll just never forget before the argument, we went into her chambers, and I got nervous. So that thing made me nervous, mm -hmm. going into her chambers. And then Pam Carlin, who was arguing for, okay. for Kurt Flood, who's an amazing argument, said, uh, advocate said she was nervous. And then Roy Engler, another amazing advocate who was arguing for Bowie Kuhn in Major League Baseball, said he was nervous. I'm like, well, they're nervous. And they're <laughs> pros, like, why aren't I nervous? And, and um, you know, I was nervous, and, and I did my best, but um, it, it was a huge thrill. Yeah. And one of the weird things about it, actually, I'm not saying that I had it harder than a Supreme Court advocate. Let me just be clear by, by what I'm about to say. But at least when you're an advocate, your back is to the audience. It's a little harder at the Supreme Court in that building to be facing the audience. I almost wish I could be facing the other way, right? You know, like one of these violinists who's playing with his back to the audience or her back to the audience. It was a packed house with everybody. I mean, it was yes. like all the lions of Washington were yes. there. Yes, and, and like to, and to see all those faces, it was intimidating. 
And, and so I remember being nervous, but it was also fun. And Sotomayor had great fun with it. And she's such a warm person and just a real extrovert um, of a person. And so um, to be able to, um, and she took photos with me and my family, some of whom have passed away, my extended sure. family. And I still have those on the wall, but she was so warm yeah. to all the different members of my family. And, and um, that was a nice thing that she did for me. And that was just a, it was a great experience. I mean, I've had a lot of great experiences working with the Supreme Court Historical Society on um, projects. And one of my favorite ones was when we did something on Justice Holmes. And I uh, moderated, and, and I had Ted White, who wrote a great book on sure. Justice Holmes called um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, just as Oliver Wendell Holmes' Law and the Inner Self. And then um, James McPherson, the great yeah, yeah. you know, Civil War historian um, on Battle Cry of Freedom. And it was all about kind of Holmes and the Civil War and how home, the Civil War experiences shaped Holmes' as a worldview. But to have these two just giants in, giants, the, in the historical per, per, And it was my job just to lob questions and see how they answer, having read McPherson and read Ted White and, and to do that. So I, I've had a lot of like fun experiences like that. Well, you're you're just a fun guy. Well, thanks. That's nice of you to say. Yeah, <laughs> I've been I've been lucky, right? It's kind of better to be lucky than good. So I've had a lot of fun experiences and and gotten lucky at certain points in time. And and um, if you don't have luck, everybody needs some luck along the way. Exactly. So well, we're honored to, that we pause, take it, we steal a little bit of your time here while you're at Chautauqua talking about Felix Frankfurter. We're off here talking sports and. Uh, and Kurt Flood, and it, you know, you've uh, you have been the guy they always refer to when you talk about Kurt Flood, Brad Snyder's books. Read Brad Snyder's book. I mean, that's got to be just fulfilling. Have you ever thought about doing kind of a, a uh, an update? I mean, I assume new material has come in. It's funny that you say that. I haven't thought about it until you mentioned it. Um, you know, I think there are two obvious things that have happened since I published the book. First of all, when I'm writing the book and I'm flying all over the country on my own dime, just like Richard Ben Kramer was doing for his book, What If It Takes, using like every dollar of my advance on expenses and, and you know, trying to find cheap flights and flying this place and staying on friends' couches and doing the interviews. I didn't think like, oh, I'm going to write the definitive book on Kurt Flutter. Oh, like 20 years from now, people are still going to want to talk to me about Kurt Flood. I just wanted to write a good book. I didn't really understand when I was working on it that the sto Kurt story would keep reverberating mm -hmm. with people the way that it has and that its significance would continue to grow um, as um, different things happen in sports. And I'll just point to two things that I think that have happened that would be a good, I don't know, a postscript about Kurt, but about his story or the impact of his story. You know, I think the first thing um, I would point to is LeBron James as a decision. Because that's like the ultimate vindication or triumph of Kurt Flood in this odd way. I know a lot of people didn't like it when he had a live broadcast on ESPN where he decides to pick his next team. But that's how much power James had, right? Where he's deciding between the Cavs or somewhere else. And when he says, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach, right now. But I know he's been criticized for that. But that's the ultimate in player empowerment, um, that he can have a prime time show mm -hmm. and do that. That's exactly what Kurt wanted all athletes to be able to do, to choose their own destiny, right, about where they wanted to be. And so um, I thought that was a huge high water mark. The other one was when Garrett Cole and you know I'm not the biggest Yankee fan in the world. I grew up an Oriole fan. But when Garrett Cole is a, at his press conference after getting however hundreds of millions of dollars he got, I can't remember how many of it was, okay, it was somewhere between 200 and 300. And his first words out of Garrett Cole's mouth at his press conference was, I'd just like to thank Kurt Flood. And I was blown away by that. Yeah. Like here's a guy many, many, many generations removed from Kurt Flood, and, and he said that his catcher on the Pirates made him write a book report about Kurt Flood as kind yeah. of a rookie initiation. And I'll come up with the name of the catcher in a minute. But that's somebody asked Kurt Cole, like, why'd you, how do you know about Kurt Flood? And that's what he said. 
Um, John is the first name of the catcher. I'll get it in a minute. And um, but I was just kind of blown away. Yeah. You know that here was this guy, you know, making you know on the cusp of generational wealth. And he doesn't thank his parents. He doesn't thank the team. First words out of his mouth. I like to thank Kurt. Yeah. That was an, I got kind of chills seeing that. And so that, that, that was a big moment. I think just even in sports, it just shows that, that um, Kurt Flood still matters. Well, obviously much of that matters because you wrote that book. And so kudos at a very young I, age. And I, here you are still a young I, age. I appreciate it. Oh, I it's, appreciate it's, it's all true. And obviously even the Jackson Center on the 50th anniversary of the case. Uh, I know. That was amazing. That was amazing. And I didn't even like think about that. Like, you know, are people still, people still talk about it. You know, every anniversary of like, Anniversary of the oral argument, anniversary of the decision, yeah. um, anniversary of when he filed the lawsuit. I just, I, you know, I never thought that would be a thing, you know, when I, when I wrote it. I just thought it was a good story, yeah. you know, just like Gideon's trumpet is a good story. And I also thought the opinion was an abomination and, and still is, and I still have hope that it'll get overturned. Well, thank you. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Greg. And this was fun. Yeah, a great. Ed.